Hi everyone, it's MJ. Welcome back to Hypothesis Testing. In the previous video, we looked at the goodness of fit test and we used this test statistic, which we are going to be using again for our contingency table example, where what we're going to be doing is testing where the two factors are independent. So contingency tables can be used to test if two factors are independent. And what we're going to be doing is going through a very easy example to just illustrate this whole point. So our two factors are going to be company. We have three companies, A, B, and C. We weren't very creative with the names. And we will have the claims. How many, or what was their claim proportion of these companies? And we want to see, are they the same? So think of this as being car insurance. Is the one company having a much lower claims than the other one? This could either indicate that there's either fraud going on in one of the companies or one of the companies is not actually paying out claims how it should be. So it is an interesting test that you can do to see if there's anything fishy going on in the business world. In our example, we would be given the following information. We'd be told that we have these three companies, A, B, and C. We'd be told that their claim proportion is as follows, 23, 28, and 20. We'd also be told the number of policies. So number of policies in force, 100, 100, 200. Now we're getting all of this information from the exam question. So if you're like, where on earth did those numbers come from? They will have been given to us in the exam question. That is our data. Now, what we've been told is we need to take a or make a statistical test to test whether there is in fact independence between these two factors or if something weird is going on with the companies. Now, to do that, we're going to be use hypothesis testing. And remember, I spoke about uh, the procedure in the very first video, the six steps. Well, we're going to be going through those six steps. Okay, so first step. First step is to write out our hypothesis. And this, I don't know, some people do find writing out the, the null and alternative hypothesis as being the hardest part. If you do get it wrong, you do mess up the whole question. So you, you do want to pay a little bit of attention here. Uh, the null hypothesis could be that the population uh, proportions are equal. And the reason for that is if these three different population proportions are equal, then it's very likely that the two factors are independent and that the company doesn't have any effect on claims. The alternative hypothesis is therefore going to be that the population proportions are not equal. Okay, if you're battling with that step, do some, do some practice, get your head around that because if you get that wrong, like I say, the rest of the question does fall apart. If you get that right, the rest becomes quite straightforward. Uh, so yeah, this is step one. Step two is choosing the test stat and I mean we've kind of given away which test that we're going to be using because it's you know hello it's the title of this video so we are going to be using contingency tables and what are contingency tables well that's the point of this video to explain how they work um, so what we're going to be doing is is calculating our contingency table we're going to calculate our test stat because we've got our data let's put it to use so in a sense, what we're going to be uh, creating is three tables. So the first table, let's get a different color over here. The first table we can call observed. So what was the data that we observed? And the tricky thing here is we're not just regurgitating these values, but we are going to be combining them with the number of policies. So for example, we have company A, B, and C. We want to check how many claimed and how many didn't claim. So we see for, for A and B, it's going to be quite straightforward because 23% times 100 is just, you know, it's 23, 28, and then what we have, 77, we have 72. For company C, we've got 200 policies, which means it's going to be double. 200 times 20%, we're going to have 40, and then the, in order to get 200, it'll be 160. Okay, so this is the very first table that you create. Uh, it's always good to sum the totals. It's a good little check. And um, what we're interested in is this 
91 over there. And you see in total there are 400. Okay, but we'll get to that. We'll get to that. And we, in fact, we will get to it right now. We'll get to it right now. So what we're going to see is if we, if we assume that these things, because that's remember, hypothesis testing, we're making the assumption. We're making the assumption that these things are independent. So therefore, if they are independent, they're all coming from the same population, we can combine them all together. So we can have this big overall population uh, proportion, which is equal to 91 divided by 400. So 91 divided by 400, and that's going to give us this value over here. Uh, you can put that in your calculator and you get 0 0.2275. Now, we are going to be using this number here with the number of policies, okay? And together, together, we are going to calculate our second table, which is called our expected table. So if this is the population parameter, remember that's hypothesis testing, we're making this assertion. If that is the case, what can we expect? So once again, we have A, B, and C, and we have the claims, and we have the, well, let me maybe write that over here. We have the claims and the non-claims. Okay, this is our next table. Sorry, that table looks horrible. But we can work with it, we can work with it. So we're taking 0 0.2275, and we're multiplying it by the number of policies so the number of claims that we expected is 22.75 uh, subtracted by 100, because remember there's 100 in total, we're going to get 77.25. Cool. With B, what we're going to get is exactly the same because it's got also 100 policies. It's 100 policies times that uh, value over here. And then again, 77.25, 100. Then C is the little bit of the tricky one. We're now timesing this by 200, um, in which case we're getting the answer of 45.5. And remember, these equal to 200, subtract those together, we get 154.5. Always sum them across just to double check. We see, okay, we get that 91 again, we get 309, and we're getting 400 going down and 400 going there. Okay, great. We've made these checks to make sure we haven't made a mistake. Don't underestimate the checks. It is very easy, especially in an exam when you've got time pressure, that you will be making mistakes as you go forward. So if you can, it's always nice to throw in these checks, and examiners also appreciate it. Now what we're going to do is calculate our third table, which is the difference. Okay, let's look at our difference. And essentially what we're going to be doing is subtracting these values from these values. Remember, our test stat is, is of that form OI minus EI divided by EI, and that's squared. So we are now going to create a table of this. You don't have to, you don't have to, but just for illustration purposes, um, it's quite nice to just, just make a little table. And we can see that we're going to have six differences because we have six cells. So 23 minus 22.75, we see that we're going to get 0 0.25. Um, and if this one here, 25 there, we're going to get 5.25. I'm just subtracting this one from this one. And then I'm going to get negative 5.25 when I subtract this one from this one over here. Um, and then we're going to have negative 5.5 and 5.5. Cool. And you can see this is why we need to use the square because otherwise these guys will cancel each other out. But this is the third table that we create. It's the difference between the observed and the expected. We're now going to use that to calculate our test stat. Okay, so we're going to use the differences. And remember, the test stat also relies on the expected in the denominator. So we're also going to be using this over here. So let's write out our test stat. It's observed minus expected squared divided by expected. And we're going to get the following. We're going to get 0 0.25 squared, I got it from there, divided by 22.75, and I got that from there. Then I'm going to plus uh, 5.25 squared, divided by, and that's what I got it from there, divided by 22.75, by 22.75, plus 
negative 5.5 squared divided by that value over there, which is 45.5. Okay, and you kind of get the point. I do that for, I don't want to do it for the next, there'll be three more. Okay, but you must do it. You can't be lazy in the exam. You can't just go dot, 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 dot. You must actually write them. I just, yeah, conscious of time. And um, then you, know, you can use your calculator. I don't expect you to do that in your head. And you can get 2.43. Okay, we like this value. We're going to be using this value now to calculate our P value. Okay, so now we come to calculate our P value. So how do we calculate our P value? We're going to have the probability that our test statistic um, is going to be greater than 2.43. But in order to do this, we need to assign, because there's a whole bunch of chi-squared distributions, we need to assign a degree of freedom. Okay, the degrees of freedom is 2. I'm going to tell you, should I tell, should I tell you now? Let me tell you now. Okay, how do I get 2? Well, how do we get 2 degrees of freedom? If we want to do degrees of freedom with contingency tables, we have the following formula, okay? And that is equal to rows minus 1 times columns minus 1, which what we have, how many rows do we have? We have 2 rows minus 1 times 3 columns minus 1, which is equal to 1 times 2, oh, hardest sum of the day, and we see 2. So that's how we got our 2 degrees of freedom. There is a whole philosophy on how you get your degrees of freedom and how we got to this formula and it's very intense but it's very unlikely that they're going to ask you a philosophical question in the actuarial stats exam. Um, at this level you just need to know this formula and apply it. Uh, if you are interested and it is an interesting thing I do recommend that you go check it out or if you want to ask me feel free to ask me and we can discuss it in the comment section below. Okay, but now that we have our probability that the chi-squared with two degrees of freedom, and we want to know yeah, what is our p-value, we simply go to the tables, and I mean, this is where you can actually get a little bit lazy. You can actually use the, the approximation, and you can see it is approximately 30%. Now, the reason why we can't go with this approximation, and I'm getting this from the tables, is because... All we need to really do is show that our p-value is greater than 0 0.05. In fact, this is going to be the final step when we're going to be inferring. We can say, since our p-value is greater than 0 0.05, so that's why it doesn't really matter if this is 31 or 29%, as long as we can show that it is significantly larger than 0 0.05, we don't have to worry about accuracy. And we can say, since our p-value is greater than 0 0.05, we fail to reject HO, which in simple English is accept, but remember you can't say accept because of the whole uncertainty factor and the errors and everything which I have I've spoken about in the other videos. Um, it is a little bit confusing the first time you come because, I mean, we do associate the word fail not with success, and this is exactly what we do want. This is like, it is successful if we fail to reject, but I think, think of it as in there is the double negative. And in that way, because we're failing to reject HO, we can almost make the statement that, yes, there does seem to be independence between company and claim, which means our assertion was not necessarily true. We just don't have enough evidence to say that it is not true. And that is one of the lovely quirks of statistics. But like I say, when we start going into degrees of freedom and the language we use, it does start getting a little bit philosophical where at the end of the day, what we're really interested in is calculating you know, this test stat, which we can then use to calculate the p-value, um, which just makes the examiners happy. But these are the steps that we would take for the contingency tables. And once again, we are using the same test statistic that we did when we were using goodness of fit test. So there we go, we're done. And uh, let me know if you've got any thoughts or any questions. And I'll see you in the exam questions where we'll tackle much trickier ones. I just wanted a nice simple explanation so that you kind of get your head around this whole idea. It's not that bad. It's not that scary. But although the exam questions can get a bit tough. But I'll see you for those. Keep well, everyone. Cheers. For more content, study advice, and exam questions, enroll in Statistics by MJ. Link in the description below.